MFA writers. Like always, we are thrilled to have you here. Today we've got a conversation with Brandon Blue of Arizona State University. This episode was requested by Sarah Blood. We hope you like it, Sarah. If anyone else has a request, feel free to give us a shout, and we will do our best to book someone from that program. I also want to give a shout out to Kia Rowe, who recently left us a review on Apple Podcasts. Kia wrote, Super helpful. Jared is the man. This podcast was a game changer for me during the research process for MFA programs. Thank you to Jay and to the team as well. Keep up the incredible work. Thank you, Kia, for the kind words. I really appreciate it. You can find MFA Writers on Instagram and Twitter as well as MFAWriters.com. We love to hear from listeners, so feel free to shoot us a direct message on one of those platforms or an email at MFAWritersPodcast at gmail.com. And if you have a minute to rate or review the show, the best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts. Doing so will help boost our podcast as we try to boost these amazing writers. Also, if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, you can apply at MFAWriters.com. On that same website, you can also click the support button to support us financially, if it's within your means. Or you can do so by going directly to buymeacoffee.com slash MFAWriters. Finally, as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to MFA Writers, the podcast where we talk to creative writing MFA students about their program, their process, and a piece they're working on. I'm your host, Jared McCormick. Today I'm with Brandon Blue. Brandon is a black, queer poet, educator, and MFA candidate at Arizona State University who is from the Washington, D.C. area. He's an assistant editor for Storm Cellar Magazine, and his work has appeared or will appear in Barzak, the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival Poetry Anthology, Pank, and elsewhere. His work was also featured in the Capital Pride Poem a Day event, and he's received support from the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing. His chapbook, Snapshot, is forthcoming from Finishing Line Press. Today, Brandon has brought two poems to read for us. The first poem I'm going to be reading is called Snapshot. It ends my collection, and it's a cento, meaning that it takes a line from each of the poems of the book to create a new poem. So you can kind of think of it as like a snapshot of the book. Snapshot. The sensation of accelerating. The water reflects only what is presented. Hold it in your hand, now feminized, a desire. Etched into that space, my heart reaching towards your body. Like adolescence, our skin is not melting into the familiar. Leaves are patterning the sky your hands in mine, a succulent gush from fish fry for donations, cradled by this night's lover, straddled around what I am, the dangerous brought willingly into the body. The second poem I'm going to be reading is called Cathedral. Um, It's an ephrastic poem, so it is after... John Flint's Time Machine 9. Cathedral. Around my apartment, sometimes I see me there, an almost older, younger me doing nothing. A mound under the sheets, sat staring out the window, deciding what to eat. I call him my cathedral. In Italy, they have all these rules around abandoned buildings, cultural property, each building its own anthropological history to learn from, even in their ruin. Sometimes when I remember this, I try to reverend him, try to sit with him, kiss him, engage him like I would dutiful birds but he's never quite there. I get arm's length sometimes, even brush his hair. 
So close to my own longing stare. I was too close. He did not leave a note. Brandon, it was great hearing you read those. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, the first thing I noticed when reading your poems was the use of form, like you mentioned before reading that first one. And I wanted to ask about that because people tend to have strong feelings one way or the other when it comes to form. I've heard from writers who shy away from them because they say they find them too constricting. But you told me that you actually find freedom in using them. So what drew you to form in the first place? And what about it do you find freeing? Yeah, I used to be a form hater once a time ago. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It used to be all those things that felt like they were so specific in what they were asking of you that it almost felt like the poem was another structure asking me to fit inside of. And so I really resisted it for a long time until I had a friend who was really um, excited about form and we talk about the ways that form is another way of communicating in a poem. Obviously, a lot of forms might repeat lines or ask you to repeat words. And so I think it's a really interesting question to ask what am I communicating if I have to move and allow myself to repeat the same phrase or some version of a phrase over and over again? And so when I say that it's freeing for me, I'm really rarely sitting down to be like, today I'm going to write a sonnet. Many times when I'm writing down and I'm trying to get a poem working on the page, sometimes I'll keep on returning to a line or I'll come back to a few words and say to myself, I think this is really asking to be a sestina or this is really asking um, to be short enough to really like move in the way a sonnet does. And so for me, it's those moments of being able to say, okay, I'm like relenting to the form. I'm relenting to the words. They're pushing me in a certain direction. Yeah. I was curious about how, it affected your process. So I'm guessing just how you might start writing something and and through the process of writing it, decide what form it should be. I imagine there are times when you write something and you feel like it doesn't need to be or shouldn't be in a form at all. A hundred percent. Sometimes I think inventing your own shape and your own ways for repetition is just as important as using something that is maybe more known or has been written in for a long time. Um, And so sometimes when people, I go to workshop, people are like, this is a little weird one. It's in its own little shape. (laughs) And I'm like, it's just what the poem wanted to be. And (laughs) it felt good enough for what it's going to be for today. Yeah. Before the interview, you mentioned this idea of invented versus received forms and me being like a total poetry novice. I was like, I'm not really sure what that means. So I was going to ask you about that. I think you just answered it, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit more. Definitely. So obviously um, in poetry, there are ways of writing poems that have existed for years and millennia and have a lot of, um, almost like cliche implication inside of them, Mm -hmm. whether it be like a huzzle, which obviously has a long tradition in uh, like a Persian culture, but it has in it in and of itself has created its own language and then use when it comes to the Americas or like the haiku or these European forms that a lot of people have known and studied. All of them um, hold a kind of a, larger kind of cloud over top of them. And so it's interesting to work inside those forms and either lean in or subvert them, or in some ways also I recontextualize them based off of the identities of the person who is writing it. So for me as a queer person, when I write a sonnet, I'm not usually writing a like... (laughs) a love poem to a person who, you know, won't love me back. (laughs) But what does it mean for me to write about love in the club? You know what I mean? About (laughs) other queer people who are having like beautiful moments without me. Like, I think there's a way in which that interplay comes to the surface, which of course is different 
than an invented form, which I was talking about earlier, which might be coming from you or from somebody you know closely, or even, of course, the more like the more like popular newer forms that are happening. So I'm thinking about like Torney Great Houses, like a burning high bomb. Or thinking about um, Terrence Hayes's uh, Golden Shovel. These are like newer forms that were invented for like a singular purpose that have just become so popular that they start to bleed into that received form place. But I think they're all at the end of the day, like communicating something specific. And it's really up to the poet to know and understand what that communication is and decide to lean in or subvert. Yeah, that's interesting. And I want to hear you talk about that idea a little bit more, the idea of, of what it's communicating. Because I can imagine how writing in forms affects the writer and affects their process. But you told me that you're actually thinking about how the form will affect the reader and how they read that poem. How is it that you conceptualize that or think about that while you're writing the poem or deciding what form to use? I think like a really good example is the villanelle it's a uh, form that I think a lot of people know from pop culture, especially like do not go gently into that good night. It starts with those two lines that you're going to hear a million times over, but uh, what it's placed with in every new stanza while rhymed should recontextualize kind of what we're thinking of. And then like any good rhyme where we have a B pattern, which there is in that form, you want that B rhyme to feel notably like different and to hold a different weight. So not only is the form asking you to maybe repeat like a maxim or like a line that can hit and you can hold on to, but the form is also pushing you to also think about the counterbalance inside of that to repeat the same line four times um, and to keep it fresh and interesting requires a lot from the writer. And so when we get to the reader who's reading it, my hope or my aim is that by the end of this, we've really investigated what these lines hold, what they're talking to, and also the fact that obviously Ryan and Meter are going to direct yourself to particular words. So what does it mean, for instance, to be hearing like dust, 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 in the uh, opposite, like the B rhyme is words like death and chest. Like these are asking you to hold so many things at once, but at the same time, the form is directly moving you towards what I hope is a more specific idea. Now I feel like I should have read a Villanelle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like you said, there's a few famous ones out there. So listeners can go find one and see what you're talking about. Or they can go by Snapshot. Any villanelles in Snapshot? There are. There is one villanelle in Snapshot. Okay. <laughs> All right. Another reason to go by it. <laughs> yeah. Well, in addition to being a poet, you're also a visual artist, and your work often crosses between the two. So tell us about the visual art you do and how you use that to enhance or complement your poetry. So I, I, I don't know that I would call myself a visual artist per se. I like, I love visual art and it's very funny because I'm, I am in an art show that's happening in two days from now. Um, but that was based off of a class here at ASU where there was all about collaborations with the visual artist and I just happened to make something, but I was not a big poetry person as a kid. Um, I loved looking at art and thinking about art and experiencing it. And so when poetry really came into my life and I was thinking about it, it just made so much sense when there was this whole tradition of writing about describing and interfacing with art that I wouldn't dive deeply into it. And so when you start really looking into the history of aphrastic art, writing about visual art or I would expand it to even like music and other things. There's a long tradition of really like looking at it, describing it and having the speaker of the poem either resonate with, with like the intention of the art or in some ways like describe what the argument of the art piece is for readers who might never actually see that artwork. But for me personally, there is a more contemporary idea of a which is like moving along with the art, finding art, that isn't just aesthetically 
um, overlapping with what you're writing, but also really thinking about the history of it and the ways in which you kind of fall into the experience of being in that artwork. And so not necessarily needing to reference or see the artwork ever at all to appreciate the poem, but that the poem is in some ways informing the artwork as much as the artwork is informing the poem. And so for me, that conversation is so much more interesting to me because it's not only kind of a treasure hunt for myself to continually like hoard pieces of art that I love off the internet that I can always come back to, but I love to allow myself to really like meditate on the artwork and ask myself like, what is it about this artwork that one, I took the time to save, to come back to, and two, how am I going to eventually reference it or make a little bit of a connection? So it's not just as if, you know, it was another piece of like inspiration. Well, your website describes you as a writer whose identities weigh heavily into your work, as do the body, the erotic, family, and relation. So what is it about poetry and visual art you think that lends itself to exploring those themes? I think visual art, especially photography, um, and to some degrees painting too, is like some of the most poetic art that there is. The way that it's capturing a singular moment, the way that it implies but doesn't show everything, the way that the eye moves slowly from corner to corner to really take it all in, but also there's like almost an immediate reaction at the same time. And so when we're thinking about, especially a thing like identity, which is so slippery and in some ways can be so marginalizing to be able to make that relation, that connection more evident in our everyday lives in the ways that we experience each other, the ways that other people have experienced adjacent ideas, I think is so powerful. Because I think at, at like the heart of a lot of uh, art making, in some ways, is a statement that like I have experienced this and I am still here. And in that, I think is an eroticism. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, it's a weird thing to say, but I really do think the ways in which we project we relate to each other is so sensual in our everyday lives we hold each other like physically or emotionally we create patterns to kind of aid another we think about the ways in which even the distance of how closely somebody stands next to each other and the cultural aspects to why somebody would or would not there's always in it an implicit like dynamic of power and uh like uh submission, an idea having to do with the ways in which our everyday lives are really connected to this thing that we don't really <laughs> like to talk about very often, especially in American culture. And especially when we start thinking more largely about the word erotics to also think about the ways that we relate to ourselves. And for me, and this is trying to tie in the family a little bit, I have my own kind of uh, strained relationship with my family, but it's never a thing that I can get too far away from. And so in those ways that I am able to connect with others, I think the same way that the photograph implies something that's not there, I think in many ways, whether or not I'm writing about it directly, the idea of community, about family, about chosen family are never too far outside because I'm choosing the subjects I am focusing on. You mentioned that idea of like art as a way to communicate your survival, that you're still here, you know, that can be an intense connection when, when a reader interacts with that art and has that same feeling and, and feels as though the artist is connecting in some way, especially for someone who might feel marginalized to feel that connection with someone who's also gone through that similar thing. How could there not be a little eroticism there, right? A hundred percent. And like, again, eroticism, while it has like the connotation of sex, and I do write about sex pretty explicitly <laughs> in some of my poems, I do think that there is erotics in like friendship. There's erotics in sure. the ways yeah. of professionalism. Like it's everywhere. And I think it's it would be dumb of us to kind of get away from it in some way. 
it's a deep connection to someone on some level, right? It doesn't have to just be about sex. Yeah. But that's fun too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> pleasure it's good for you (laughs) all right so we've mentioned snapshot a couple of times but i want to give you a chance to talk about it a little bit it is your debut chat book it's coming out from finishing line press very soon it's currently available for pre-order and if i'm not mistaken it will be published on november 17th so tell us about the project how you've distilled all of these things we've been talking about into this debut Yes, it is true. It, it is coming out on November 17th. So um, please, please, please order. Uh, so Snapshot is kind of a love uh, letter to my undergraduate experience. So many of these poems started there and expanded in my time after that. And it's really a book that for me is about confronting health narratives of Black queer life and the ways in which I'm striving for a place that feels warm enough for belonging. Narratives of survival and queerness intersect with our everyday lives. And I'm trying to do that specifically through engagement of art and through the narratives of my own life and a little bit of the eroticism because you can't get too far away when you're talking about queer people to talk about the reason why queer people are marginalized. Um, So it is a sexy book. But it is a book that is uh, working formally, again, to do that. So like I said, I read at the beginning, Asento, which I said, and it is true, it does end the book with one long poem that takes from all of these to create something new. But the poem asserts the snapshot multiple times, in part to remind you that the poem, the, the book is working in this way, but also because a lot of the stories in the poems themselves can feel dour. A lot of them end in places that don't feel like resolution. A lot of them feel like they're reaching towards the thing without really being able to achieve the thing. And so I really wanted to try to end on a more positive note, a kind of remix of all of the narratives and all of the hardships that that are introduced in the book and create something a little bit more beautiful, but also something a little bit still painful because we don't get away from the pain as much as we want to. Um, And like the speaker of the poem themselves also shapeshifts even outside of the snapshot. Like it, we go from somebody in their room smashing a bug to being on the beach with a lover. Like I said, love in the club. There's a (laughs) dominatrix in here. There's sword swallowing. There's a lot that's trying to do, that's all reaching towards, like I said, those central ideas of like belonging, of survival, of um, a real sense of identity fulfilled. And so that's, that's kind of the aim of what the book's trying to get at. All in like 32 pages. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Well, the title poem was a beautiful poem. I really enjoyed it. And it does make me want to go read the other poems and see what you pulled from to create that. So I hope listeners also uh, are excited to go read that. They should go order one as soon as they're done listening to this episode. Okay, so I want to talk about your time in the MFA program at Arizona State University. But first, I want to talk a little bit about how you got there. You were a middle school and high school French teacher for seven years before applying to MFA programs. How was that experience and what motivated you to pursue the MFA? I loved teaching middle school and high school. It sounds weird, but it's what I got my degree in. I also have a master's in education and I went through my undergrad taking creative writing classes uh, because I loved it and I loved writing. But at the same time, I was like, you don't make money off of writing. So, of course, I became a teacher, which is super lucrative. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And so I did it and I loved it. I was having a great time doing it. And I had received the uh, advice from my mentors and friends who went straight to their MFAs to wait. That um, academia pushes you in a very particular way to produce on a schedule. And in some ways, those larger questions about why are you writing anything? um, What are the subjects you're choosing to write about now? All of those things really need to come to the forefront before you decide to jump into academia again. 
And because I had this love for teaching, I said, sure, I'll do that. So that was great. Uh, Public education is hard, but I knew what I was getting into. And honestly, I feel like I started my MFA a bit early, but I really started it because of COVID. I taught all through COVID online, like in person and online at the same time, like the hybrid model, and then everybody in person. And there were some really hard conversations with myself and with like some of those deep conversations that um, friends had been telling me about, like, why am I writing? Why am I still buying these books and writing anything at all? That I at some point had to tell myself that I said, well, things are getting really bad on the public education sector. And I need to remind myself that I am also still a creative person. So I'm just going to apply to any university that I would have a hard time saying no to, Um, which meant for me, health insurance included, fully funded um, writers who I really respected or who I'd known about, even though I hadn't read their work very much, and specifically were outside of the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, because through all of my schooling, I had never left. And so... I did that as kind of a whim and, you know, I put work into my essays and my packets and I sent it to friends so they would read over it. But really and truly, when I was putting out these applications, I was doing it as a way to remind myself that, like, I am still a person who is able to create things for myself. And it just so happened I got into, like, a few places. (laughs) (laughs) So then I said to myself, I was like, well, like, I I literally said it would be hard for me to say no. And... Here I am, second year. <laughs> okay, so so you mentioned you got that advice from friends and mentors to wait. Having done that and then having gone to the MFA program, I'm curious to hear what advice you have to people who are considering the MFA, who maybe are in a career and, and are, are interested in doing this thing, but they're not sure if they should leave their career. Do you have any advice for them? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> if, you are, if you are thinking about doing it straight out of undergrad don't like (laughs) I just looking at like my own life skills and time management and again really asking those questions of like how do you hold a nine to five but find time to write find time to go to your local open mics to create a new community of writers that are not implicit in one particular space that is like the university. That's probably the background that you're getting from. All of those things are exceedingly important skills to have. And it doesn't take seven years like I did. Um, that could literally take like two or three years to really know what that feels like. But I'd really like dissuade people from going immediately from undergrad to grad. If you are in a career and you are going in or thinking about going back to academia for MFA, um, I think having a really specific idea of what you want out of an MFA is going to really shape your decision of the type of program you want to be in. So I'm in a full residency program, which of course takes up a lot of my time. I teach on the university level, all of those things, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But that made sense for me as somebody who has a degree in education and who doesn't see teaching on the university level, even if it's just like English 101 for a little bit, I don't see that as like leaving my own personal goal of where I'm going. But there are amazing writers at low residency uh, situations that are, I know are a lot easier to fit into your schedule, a lot less expensive and so doable. And I really don't think that like being an MFA is solely about a job at the end but I do think it has everything to do with those like individual reasons for why you are deciding to take up this sometimes two to three year commitment. Yeah. It's a big commitment. And like we said, you ended up at Arizona state university. Their program is a three year fully funded program with tracks in fiction and poetry. According to the website, the program is and has always been an unswervingly student first program with small classes, intimate workshops, and one-to-one mentoring. Part of me included that just so I could say the word unswervingly on the air. But I'm <laughs> curious to I'm curious to hear your take. Would you describe ASU's MFA as student-centered? I would. I will also put the caveat that just like 
I, as an instructor, had my own like variants when it came with COVID. I feel like ASU and many other universities for people that I know of are all settling again. And so I will say definitely small classes, a hundred percent, unless it is a like required class from everybody. I think this semester is my first semester ever where it's been more than like 12 people. Um, and even my workshop right now is only like six people. I'm taking a translation class where it's only five people. So definitely small. A lot of what's asked of us is also to really be active participants in there. So not only is it centered on having small classes, but also having lots of time um, for you to lead discussion on things and to make your opinions and your viewpoint known. I will say the interfacing with professors, I feel like has just been lower because there's so many people who are in and out of sabbatical or even like um, trying to track people down sometimes because there are some superstars on this campus who are like fully doing their own books. And like, I totally get it. And when they're here, they're amazing. But sometimes it's like, oh, so-and-so won't be available for a week because they're in London. And I'm like, work, have fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good information for listeners, good, and it's an important thing to think about because you can look at the faculty on staff at a program and be like, okay, I really want to work with this person, but there's a chance that person could go on sabbatical for one of the years that you're there. That happened to me in my program with one of the professors. So you can ask, you can ask uh, admin or ask the professors after you apply. They may or may not know when you first arrive, right? So that's kind of something where you just, you have to be a little bit flexible and you have to kind of go in just aware that that might happen, right? That's 100%. You mentioned that the uh, workshops were really small. Maybe you could tell us a bit more just about the workshop experience at ASU. Yeah. So obviously workshops are going to change professor by professor. Right now I'm taking a workshop with a visiting professor who's also an alumni, Dexter L. Booth. Um, right now, the way that he's structuring it is we're reading um, a few books and having discussions, really focusing on voice that takes about half of the class. And then it's a poem a week to workshop through. Um, we do a mixture of a kind of like gag Iowa style workshop where the writer doesn't speak while people comment. And then it shifts more into a questioning model where uh, folks are after hearing things are able to ask specific questions and direct to get the most out of their experience. And so while that's not the experience of every single workshop, what I will say is that like every single instructor that I've had in my, this is my third semester now, they've all come in with really particular skills that they like to focus on, which I find to be really nice. Um, Cause while everybody of course is writing and working in their own projects to really have somebody pushing you particularly like the first semester we were really pushed to think about full arcs. It was a class thinking about larger work or like longer work. My second semester was really thinking about image and about lyric ideas. And now to be thinking really specifically about your voice, it kind of makes it that even if you're taking workshop over and over again, which not everybody chooses to take workshop every single semester, if like I have, if you decide to do it, it's not stale or boring. But also, you don't really have to take your own genres workshop. I know there are plenty of people who decide to take fiction workshop. Occasionally, there's a nonfiction workshop that's offered um, from some of the people on faculty. So there's a lot of variance about, you know, what it's going to be like, not only by who's instructing it, but also who's in the room with you. Because sometimes the fiction people are killing it in poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I took a poetry class. It was very intimidating, but it was, I learned a lot from it. Uh, and I do think it helped my fiction in the end, just like thinking about, um, the line more thinking about language more. So I always suggest that students, if they get the chance to take a workshop in another genre, it's only going to help you get better at your primary genre. And Hey, you might fall in love with the secondary genre, right? Exactly. Even though I will say I'm also a wimp. I have not taken a fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh, writing 20 to 25 pages. I'm like, I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to go back to one thing you said earlier, which was this idea that like in the post COVID lockdown world that we're like living in right now, a lot of programs are kind of settling back in and figuring out the structures and shapes that they're going to have going forward. And you told me that because of this, 
you believe self-motivation is essential to a worthwhile MFA experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? A hundred percent. So in a landscape where there are gaps in who might be present or even new people who are also trying to figure out what is the culture and the way in which things can be done. I think the most important thing that people can know is that at the end of the day, you only have the time that you are at at the university, which means that you have to be the person who is emailing, who is asking questions at times doing and then asking for forgiveness later, because ultimately, at least I'm feeling even in a three-year program where I'm being asked now to start to name who might be on my thesis committee, that I can't be upset with anybody but myself if I feel like I might want to work with this person on faculty and I have made no opportunity to talk to them or even get their vibes about what they see as a working relationship in committee. And you would think it's like, oh, you know, like they'll, they'll have offered a class by that time or I'll have seen them at an event. And sometimes it's just not true. Um, and then even outside of the university experience, I also think it's important to assert that like we are all writers and artists of our own ways. And we are, if you're somebody like me who moved across the country you should be integrating yourself into that new writing community. If you're like me, who also likes visual art, that visual art community. And there are people in my programs who have gotten grants from the city of Phoenix or from Tempe to do installations for, um, uh, what's called again, around town or going into particular galleries or setting up their own collaborations outside of class. And those things while might be hinted at when talking to faculty about what people have done in the past or even your current cohort, ultimately like your ambition for setting up yourself to have worthwhile experiences all start with you. There are always going to be initiatives at the university level. There are always going to be things like events that are happening, but ultimately if you want things, if you want to look back on this experience, at least I think with like fond memories, you kind of have to create those memories. Being a three-year program, I imagine one thing that can help you kind of figure out where those opportunities are is like making close connections with the people that are in the program. Being a three-year program, you have people who have been there for a couple of years when you're arriving, right? So is there a tight-knit community within the MFA program that's helping new students learn about some of these things? A hundred percent. I will say, I think that is the most worthwhile thing that I've gotten out of my MFA so far is to get to know so many amazing writers, thinkers, and artists who, again, even if they haven't created the thing that you're thinking about, they oftentimes at least can lead you in the direction of saying like, oh yeah, There is a bookshop up the street that does a night where they do something like that. Like I think of this local bookstore called Palapas that does uh, tea and typewriting. And so if you're really looking for a cheap way to just get writing done, like it's a great place to go, but also you could make that connection to do an event with them or thinking about, oh, hey, I have this amazing opportunity, but I don't know who to ask for funding. And maybe it's not a conversation I want to have with faculty let me tell you, my cohort knows where the funding <laughs> at my university is. And it even goes across genre. Um, like, obviously, I am closest with my year of people, but I, I feel like I have really good connections with everybody, fiction or poetry from all three years. And it really is like an amazing resource to have. All right. So we mentioned earlier that it's a fully funded program. According to the website, All MFA students have a teaching assistantship that covers tuition and health insurance and provides a stipend of around $24,000 or $25,000 a year, which is on the high side when it comes to stipends. Yes. You have lots of experience teaching at other levels. How has it been teaching at the college level? I've been really enjoying it. I think, uh, like, props to my other education. Uh, Being able to teach English 101 has been really fulfilling and really interesting to work with undergraduates. Sometimes a little bit frustrating because they are still 18-year-olds, but I find it to be very fun because, again, you have a built-in cohort of people, and then for this, it also includes other incoming 
PhD students too, who are all working together to think about how to achieve the objectives of like an English 101 class at the same time. And so it's been nice. It's been a new challenge. And I think it's a really good, like no matter what you'll do afterwards, I think it's a lot of good skills to have. Um, but also it's not the only teaching you can do. Like for instance, right now I'm teaching intro to poetry alongside English 101 this semester. And next semester I will teach intro to poetry again. And that will be my only teaching assignment. Um, and then you can also get funding other ways outside of teaching. Uh, in your first year, it's a lot harder because for that first year, the university might offer you a grant it's only like one person in the for each year, their first year doesn't have to teach. But after that, you can work for uh, the Virginia G. Piper Center to kind of do work that has to do with like, I always call it kind of like creative um, nonprofit work because they're a nonprofit themselves and you work with organi- organizing and with teaching artists. There's work that you can do through the Center of Ina- Imagination and Borderlands, which is thinking about Um, how to create reading series and um, thinking a lot about uh, us being on a border in Arizona, the ways in which art making and poetry can be used in a more political radical way. Um, You can also work for Hayden's Ferry, which is our uh, literary magazine. And that I think still requires, I think one teaching appointment, but the rest of the time you're just working as the, um, editor. So even if you aren't the most motivated teacher, which I love teaching, but there are other ways of still getting all of those funding, health insurance, and the same stipend. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about that Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing that is at ASU. I know you have received support from them. According to the website, the center offers students travel scholarships, professional development support, and other teaching and leadership opportunities. So what is the center exactly? And what kinds of opportunities do MFA students have through them? So the center is in this kind of in-between zone where it is technically not of the university, but it is housed on the university. And it is a community outreach creative writing space where they provide creative writing classes to the larger like uh, Phoenix Tempe area like classes um they do provide funding if you need to go to a like a conference or if you are being named as like a select speaker they will reimburse you fellowships over the summer if you get into them you can apply for funding and you might get full or partial uh reimbursement from them and they also sometimes invite their own uh, writers to come in which of course you get to go to those for free Unfortunately, because of our contracts with TAs and stuff, we can't teach for them while we are teachers. I know that for some students, like over the summer, they can like renounce their student things and then (laughs) work with them over the summer. And then they become magically a student again when we start. (laughs) Um, But really, it's more of a place that is used as a resource for you to be a great writer and to make connections. They're also hosting the Desert Knights Rising Star Writing Conference. Yeah, I was going to ask about that Writers Conference because that's a pretty unique thing among MFA programs. I'm not sure I've ever heard of a Writers Conference being connected to the MFA program. And like you said, it's called Desert Knights Rising Stars Writers Conference. And that happens every year, I believe. So maybe you could tell us a bit more about that conference and the ways that students can get involved. Yeah, so this is the first time that it's happened since I've been here. I know with COVID, there was kind of a slow figuring out about how it's happening. But like I said, um, it's a it happens pretty much every year. They pull in a lot of big names um, and a lot of local writers, and especially a lot of local writing groups are always really excited because it's a lot of panels thinking about not only craft, but also thinking about like life as a writer. Um, and so... MFA students were given the opportunity to either present their own panels, which could be made up of only MFA students, or I know some of them that are happening between MFA students and faculty, as well as just asked to be on a panel. So the the panel that I got placed on 
is all about bringing your identities onto the page to queer the page, which I'm excited to talk about in a more extensive way with other writers. And mine isn't only with MFA students. It's also with some other writers that are just living in Arizona and the surrounding states. And of course, there's also the keynote speaker this year who's Joy Harjo. So like, Ooh, nice. come on. Yeah. <laughs> like, and obviously be on the panel, um, I get to go for free. But even if I didn't want to do for free, it would only be $35 to get in as an MFA student. And I think compared to the general price, that's quite a bit of a discount. So it's definitely something that a lot of people were excited when it was coming back for and that I've heard buzz about. But I don't know exactly how it runs, only because this is my first year that it's been happening. And what time of year does that take place? As far as I know, it always happens in fall. So this right now, it's happening in the second week of October. Um, but as, as I've heard, it always happens around that time. All right. Well, this has all been really great information. It's been awesome talking to you about your poetry and about the program. Before we go, I want to give you the last word. What is one way in which the MFA experience has been different, for better or for worse, from your expectations when applying? I think for me, um, the thing that has been most different is really thinking about how much (laughs) balancing work is required of me uh, that I, I thought I knew until I got into this program. And it's not a bad thing as much as it is a skill that I am learning to have. I think um, in a program that offers so much and that really requires you to kind of create your own opportunities and choose your own adventure, it's easy to try and overload yourself with trying to accomplish everything that you can. And in some ways, I keep on telling myself that this is a skill that if I wanted to be more of a like freelance writer that I'd have to be very good at and not only balancing my own writing, but the small gigs that I want to do applying for grants, applying for funding here and there. And when I thought about the MFA experience, I really did think of it more as like just an academic place for me to get better at my writing and maybe take some cool classes and meet some new people But really what I've learned is that there's so many opportunities to really get like real world experiences and opportunities to create for yourself that is an extra layer and that should be taken advantage of, but can sometimes be a little overwhelming. Good to know. All the information has been good to know. Again, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking to you and good luck in the rest of the program. Thank you so much. And thank you again for having me on. And everyone go buy Snapshot. Woo! (laughs) 